If you've worked on cars for a long time, and especially if you've communicated with other people about working on cars, you've probably run into a bunch of old grandpa tales that just refuse to die. Uh, that's stuff like the, the idea that an engine needs back pressure in order to make torque. That was never true. It's just one of those things that was handed around as fact before we knew any better, before we had access to dynos everywhere and we could, you know, see that there was never any truth to that. And so when I was first starting out working on cars, I just had to believe old guys. You know, who, where do you get information from aside from old guys? I hadn't been to school yet. I hadn't learned all this stuff, in, in, you know, in person. And so I had to trust old guys. And they would tell me dumb stuff like engines need back pressure to make torque. And I would just accept that as fact. But that's the difference between being ignorant and being stupid. If you're ignorant, you just didn't know. We're all ignorant about all the things we don't know yet. And, and that's fine. That's where you start to learn things and you reduce your level of ignorance. Cool. Stupid, on the other hand, is when you're presented with new information and you just reject it. You just go, nope, don't want that new information. I'm just going to stick with my old bullshit. And I mean, that's, that's a strategy, <laughs> you know, that's a strategy, I guess. And what I'd like to address today, because it's something that seems to just never die. You know, it's one of those, one of those things that just never dies is the exhaust gas recirculation system or EGR. And that's, that's what this little video is about. I'm going to try and do it kind of off the top of my head because I, I haven't prepared a whiteboard or any of that kind of stuff. It's a pretty simple concept to understand. And once you understand it, you're going to be less ignorant, you know? And if you choose to be stupid, I mean, that's on you, but at least you won't have the excuse of not having been exposed to a proper explanation before. So the first thing I'd like to mention about EGR is what is EGR? Exhaust gas recirculation. It is what it sounds like. It takes some of the exhaust that's been through your engine and recirculates it back through the intake. I know what your grandpa's saying. Hold it, okay? Let's look at it first. So, this is an engine. We can see down here that is the EGR pipe. It comes up off of the exhaust manifold and that comes up here to this rusty old valve. And that rusty old valve feeds into the intake manifold and there's a diaphragm there operated by vacuum and by this solenoid right here when the computer tells it to it opens that up and allows exhaust gas to go into the intake manifold. So before we get into why you would want to put exhaust back into the intake manifold let's talk about one of the first big grandpa things about this that, that people keep on trying to repeat which is why would you want to put dirty exhaust into your intake manifold. It's dirty. They want to, you know, it's dirty. You're going to make your valves dirty, 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 right? The camera is sitting on top of a unique tripod right now. Uh, the tripod it's sitting on top of is the old uh, H-pipe or mid-pipe from this car. Now, this car has a catted mid-pipe, meaning it has its catalytic converters in it, but I've taken off the old catted mid-pipe because it's a smaller diameter pipe and I think it actually restricts the engine quite a bit just by being smaller diameter pipe. There, there's a lot more skinny little tube that exhaust has to pass through. We're not even talking about cats. But this old H-pipe here that came out of the car has the collector tubes upstream. We'll just go ahead and turn the camera around here. This is upstream of that catalytic converter. So this is directly out of the headers. This is exactly where the EGR would be taking that exhaust from. And you can see this is the inside of it. This car is uh, 240,000 miles when I took this off. So that's 240,000 miles of the engine running. And uh, you can see that I have wiped it with my finger kind of here, but this is, uh, we'll call it virgin territory over here. So I'm going to take my, my relatively clean finger, not a whole lot of boogers on it, and I'm just going to go ahead and rub this around. And then that's, that's how much soot is on there. From a quarter million miles, from 240,000 miles, that's how much soot I got on my finger from wiping it in there. So, this is an old pushrod engine designed in like the 1950s or 60s, right? It's a small block Ford, and it's been on this car that I got from a barn in Idaho for 240,000 miles, and that's how much dirt is going to go back inside your intake manifold. So, Grandpa, sorry Gramps, you're just wrong. You're just simply wrong. So I can hear Grandpa right now. He's saying, oh, that's just some old smog stuff that's put on there to please Greta Thunberg. Well, for one thing, this car is older than Greta Thunberg. She's a young woman. This thing's like almost 30. So let's not worry about her relationship to all this stuff here. And second, like, why is, why is helping the climate a bad thing? Like, if you ever drove into Los Angeles from anywhere outside of Los Angeles, 
during the 1970s and 80s, and then you go in there now, wow, it's a big difference. It used to be like driving into a bowl of pea soup. It used to be disgusting. And now you drive over the grapevine or you come in from, you know, from Arizona and it's just, it's just another valley full of, full of buildings because of all the emissions uh, equipment that was put on both cars and manufacturing in that area. So first off, the whole premise of like stuff that's for smog is a bad thing. It's just a stupid premise. It's just, it's like so far obsolete. Go be a boomer somewhere else on your own time. Move to France. The rest of us can have a nice clean earth to live on. That out of the way though, even if you don't care about the environment, even if you actively hate the environment, you still want EGR. And here's why. See this little guy here? I'm gonna use this to simulate a cylinder or a piston in your car, right? You've got up and down, piston goes up and down. We're gonna use this to simulate a cylinder in an engine. Now you know, if you've worked on cars a lot, that a high compression engine produces more power for the same displacement and is more fuel efficient for the same displacement than a low compression engine is. And the reason for that is pretty simple. There's a couple of things. There's both the thermodynamics of compressing the latent heat in a certain volume of air down to a smaller area. Well, the amount of BTUs present in that air doesn't change. You don't just bleed off those extra BTUs. So they get shoved into a smaller area and that raises the temperature and that sets up your conditions for ideal combustion. So that's part of it. The other part of it is the molecules are closer together. So when they explode, they kick off against each other. That can be really similarly thought of as the difference between jumping off of a hard surface, just, just, just jumping off of a hard surface or jumping off of like an air mattress or a couch cushion that you stole. The difference in how high you can jump off of a hard surface versus a soft surface is very similar to why a high compression engine gets a little bit more power out of the gasoline than a low compression engine. Because when that first little kernel of explosion happens, it's got a harder wall of other molecules to push against and it pushes on the piston harder versus a low compression engine that's kind of pushing into some squishy air for a moment before it actually pushes the piston down and it's less efficient. That is one of the problems with doing this stuff kind of live and unscripted is I, I went inside and looked at the footage and it was really hard to see. So we'll see if we can do this a little bit better. So let's talk about why you would want to feed back exhaust back into your engine and why that's a good thing even if you don't care about the environment at all. We're gonna use this guy here to represent your engine, right? We've got a piston of sorts, we've got a cylinder of sorts, and we've got a way for air to get inside of it. So, normal four-stroke engine cycle, we're putting that aside for right now. Normal four-stroke engine cycle is, you've got your suck, right? You suck it in, and then your intake valve closes, you've got your squeeze, and I can't squeeze that all the way because I'm just not super strong apparently. And then you've got your bang, that's when the combustion happens. And then you've got your blow, that's when you push out the exhaust gases. We all know this, I think. If you're watching this video, you probably know how an internal combustion engine works. So when you're at full, full throttle, right? You've got no restriction from your throttle plate. You've got low intake manifold vacuum. Suck in all the air you want. Then you gotta squeeze it. You got your 10 to one compression ratio or whatever. And then you get your explosion and you get the full benefit of all that latent heat that was in all that air that got compressed down into a small area. And you've got the benefit of all those molecules being all densely packed so that the flame kernel spreads at the right speed. And you've got that kick that just at the exact right time pushes down on the piston and you get all the power out of it. Cool. So we know how that works at full throttle. What happens at part throttle? Now, I don't really have a way of like simulating a part throttle throttle body on this exactly. So what we're gonna look at is if you've got part throttle, you've got high manifold vacuum and you go to draw this down, well, you don't get a full thing of air, right? That's kind of how part throttle works. You're throttling it, you're reducing the amount of air it can get. So you draw in like that much total air and then the rest of it, because you're under vacuum, you still, your piston still travels the same distance it's just that by the time all that air gets in it, the air that's going to get into it, it's really only that much air, which means you will really only have that much latent heat from those molecules being compressed down, and you also only have that much cylinder pressure. Your effective compression ratio, not your you know numerical compression ratio from the geometry of it, but your effective compression ratio for how much air you actually get into it, it's like two to one. So that means that you don't have that latent heat from all that large volume of air, you don't have that tightly dense packed, you know, bunch of molecules that are ready to just kick off against the, the piston at the exact right time, which means that you have much lower volumetric efficiency. You get a lot less energy out of that little bit of gasoline than you would if you had all that extra cylinder pressure available to you. So that's where EGR comes in. 
Again, we've got light throttle, right? We've got high manifold vacuum because your throttle is almost closed. So you draw in a little bit of air, and then we'll go ahead and put this piece of hose on here to simulate your EGR. Then you draw in a bunch of inert, already combusted gases that don't have oxygen in it, so it doesn't throw off your air to fuel ratio. You're just drawing in inert gases. Then when you go to compress it, well, you've got all that gas to compress, so your effective compression ratio is back up where it should be. Instead of being this little tiny bit of air to compress, you're compressing quite a lot. And so all those molecules are packed tight, and when they explode, they get to kick off hard against the piston, which means that you get your volumetric efficiency back. And that means that under light throttle, you get the same ignition behavior, meaning your ignition timing doesn't have to widely swing as you adjust your throttle position, which is especially better for older cars that didn't have like coil on plug ignition. And it also means that you get all of that combustion benefit because the flame kernel is spreading through that denser air at the same speed as it would if you had a full cylinder full of air. And all that's costing you is nothing. It's, all, it's costing you nothing. Like there's no harm from it whatsoever. If your engine is burning oil, that's kind of a you thing. Uh, if your engine is running rich, that's kind of a you thing. That's not EGR doing it. So if you've got like a bunch of soot being recirculated back through there, that's not EGR doing that. That's, you need to fix your car. You know, like if you're burning oil, you're, if you're burning oil, that's, that's kind of a you problem. And so your EGR is really just there to give you more fuel efficiency and better throttle response at part throttle. And it's not in effect at all at full throttle. It's just simply not there at full throttle. So it's not costing you any horsepower. It's a win and a win. And if it happens to make the air a little cleaner in the process, how does that suck? Like, you're not losing anything. You're just gaining. You're gaining better fuel efficiency. You're gaining more throttle response. You're gaining clean air. Like, do you just want to make the air dirtier just because you're mad at Greta Thunberg or something? Because that's kind of a weird fetish. Like, I, I'm not sure I can support that. That's, that's a little wacky. So the last bit that I hear pretty often actually is, well, why don't race cars have it? And are race cars really worried about the price of gas? Like, when you're racing, are you really going, uh, I hope I can make it through the rest of this night because gas is, you know, 4.55 a gallon and I can't afford to get home. No, you're not really doing that when you're racing. And also, like, how often are race cars at part throttle worried about part throttle performance? They're not. So race cars don't have EGR on them typically because they're not really under the same conditions that street-driven cars are. Street-driven cars, you're worried about the price of gas. You're worried about part throttle response because you're pretty much under part throttle most of the time. Unless you're in a real slow car where you have to be flooring it everywhere. If you're in a car that's fast, you can't really get away with flooring it everywhere. That's how you end up dead or in jail. Now the last part of this that pretty frequently gets brought up is that brand new cars, like modern cars, don't have EGR at all, and so it must have not been a good thing. Again, that's some ignorance talking because all modern cars have EGR, at least all modern combustion cars. We're not talking about electric. That's clearly not part of this discussion. All modern combustion cars do have EGR. It's just that since they have variable cam timing, they don't need to have a separate valve to do that. They just simply leave the exhaust valve open a little bit longer under those light throttle conditions, and that allows them to draw back some of that exhaust they just spat out. They do you know, cam tricks in order to do that instead of doing it with a separate system. That's cheaper and easier for the manufacturer, a little bit more elegant, fewer parts to go wrong, so it makes their warranty life a little bit easier as well. But all modern cars have you know, variable cam timing, and all modern cars use that variable cam timing to affect things like EGR. So now you know how EGR works, I hope. Now you know that it's not costing you any power at all. It's not reducing performance at all. It's just making it so that when you're driving from A to B, you save money, and you also get a little bit better part throttle throttle response. Those things don't suck. If it happens to clean the air a little bit in the process, well, that doesn't suck either. So uh, if you choose to remain ignorant, I think that's where you start getting into stupid territory instead of just ignorant. But that's on you. Uh, I hope this has been informative. Thanks.